worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Let's sing together. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slum. Well, good morning, church family. As you can see, it looks a little different in here today. Um, for those of y'all who are watching the stream online or who are maybe watching the recording later in the week, you're getting a glimpse of it right now. But if you've been in the rest of the building here today, for those of y'all here in the room, then you'll know that our church campus has really been transformed over the last couple of weeks. I want to say a huge word of thanks to all of the volunteers who have given hour after hour after hour over the last few weeks just to get us to this point. VBS has not even started yet. It starts tomorrow night, but there have been dozens of hours that have gone into this. And so thank you so much to those who have put in so much work these last couple of weeks. If you drove past the church last night at 10 o'clock, you saw a handful of cars that were still here at 10 o'clock last night finishing things up. And I think there's still a little bit more that we're doing this afternoon or, or tomorrow as well. So thank you to those who've worked so hard to decorate, worked so hard to prepare, because tomorrow Vacation Bible School does begin. So that you know, we have 82 children currently signed up for Vacation Bible School. Yeah, that, absolutely. 82 kids signed up for VBS, and I know for a fact there's at least one more that's going to sign up um, today, probably a few more that'll show up tomorrow. So we've got a great group that will be here night after night this week to participate in Vacation Bible School. Um, what I want to make sure all of y'all know is what you can do to be a part of VBS. So the first thing that we would ask of you is to be in prayer, to be in prayer for the kids who will be coming night after night to hear the word of God, to hear the gospel, to enjoy this time with us. Be praying for those kids that Christ would work in their hearts over the course of the week. Be praying for the volunteers, the teachers who are giving of their time, giving of their efforts to make this a great week for those kids. Um, by Thursday, we're going to need that extra boost of energy that comes only through prayer. So be praying for all of our volunteers over the course of the week. Here's the second thing that you can do. If you want to help in some way and you have not yet let our, uh, our VBS chairs know, then I'm sure that they would still accept help and they will find a spot for you. So the Lindsays are our chairs. Lindsay Camp, Lindsay Springer, put your hands in the air so people know who you are. 
Talk to one of them after the service if you want to help out, and I'm sure they will find a spot for you. If you want to participate, but you think, I don't really want to run around the rec field, I don't really want to be a volunteer necessarily, but I want to be a part of what the church is doing this week, good news. We are having a vacation Bible school class for adults this year. This is for adults in our church. This is for the parents who are bringing their kids. This is for any adult who wants to take part. Larry Davis, our pastor emeritus, is going to be teaching that class. And so come on up and take part in that every evening this week. At 5.15, we will have dinner together. That dinner is free. And so we invite you to come up for that. And then at 5.45, we'll begin our programming, and it'll last till 8.15. So that's the schedule, 5.15 dinner, 5.45, we begin VBS, and we go till 8.15 every night. That's the second thing. Last thing, and then I'm done on VBS for now. Last thing is on Friday night. That is our family night. And so that is a time where we're inviting the kids for their parents to stick around all night long. And we're going to give them a glimpse of what their kids have been doing throughout the week. And so we call it family night for the sake of those parents. So that the parents and maybe the siblings will, will come for that. But it's also for you, the church family. And so even if you're not here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we would love for you to come on Friday and to be a welcoming face to those parents and to those kids, to those families. We would love for you to see what it is we've been working on all week long. And so Friday night, it's the same schedule. We'll have dinner at 515, and then we'll have family night beginning at, at 545, but would love for you all to come and take part in that. That's what I've got VBS-wise, okay? It begins tomorrow. We are so excited. Two more things I want to quickly let you know about that are coming up in the life of the church. One of those is that at the end of VBS, we're going to need something fun to do. Um, we're going to need something um, after all of that work, after all of that effort, and after all of that different kind of fun. We're going to need to just relax a little bit. And so our students are going to be headed to go play putt-putt at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on Saturday. And so um, you are invited to that. Niall wanted to make sure that I told you that. If you want to come play putt-putt with our students, we would love to have you. Um, so talk to Niall about that, 10 a.m. on Saturday, just a good, good time of fellowship. And then the last thing also with our students is that today is the last day to register for youth camp. So if you haven't signed your child up, if you haven't signed your neighbor up, if you haven't signed uh, whatever teenager is in your life that you think needs to go to youth camp, today is your last chance. Make sure you talk to Niall and uh, get them signed up. Well, church family, I am so glad that y'all are here today. I'm glad we get to worship together. And the last thing I want to say before we continue uh, in worship with prayer is happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Uh, if you are celebrating today, if you are being celebrated today, we are glad that you have made worship a part of your Father's Day. And our kids are actually going to have a little gift for all of the men uh, on the way out of the service today. So make sure you grab that in the foyer on your way out. As we continue with worship, let me go to our Lord now in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us together as a church family. Lord, for this opportunity we have to, to be blessed and to bless. For this opportunity to sing beautiful hymns and songs of praise. For this chance to worship together in spirit and in truth. Lord, we are so excited about all that this week has um, in store for us all the opportunities that we will have to share your word, to share your gospel. And so we pray for blessing over that. Lord, we pray for blessing over all the fathers that are here today. For those who are celebrating and being celebrated, God, we give thanks. And Lord, we, pardon me, we come to you now as our heavenly father, and we give you all the glory and all the praise. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Let's continue singing together. We'll sing that beautiful hymn number 458, Near to the Heart of God. Let's stand together and let's sing.
sweet, near to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release, near to the heart of God, a place where all Blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. This morning, the message is about the peace that is found in Christ, the peace that we are called to show to one another in this world. And so these songs that we're singing together are all about that peace which is found in Christ and which we then show to one another. So let's sing now this beautiful, blessed hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is
seated. I will be reading First Peter three, First Peter three eight through twelve in the New Living Translation. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead. Pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Thank you, Landon. The series that we're in right now this summer, that we're spending our time in all summer long, is on the fruit of the Spirit. These things that for those who are in Christ manifest in our lives. The way that people see Christ at work in us through the way that we live. And so this song that we'll sing together now is one that, that speaks to that idea of love and joy and peace and all the rest coming from the inside out. And so this is a, a song that's been a, been a minute since we've sung this one together, but I hope you'll sing it together with me. Let's stand together and let's sing. A thousand times I failed, your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. Will above all else my purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame my heart and my soul I give you control to sue me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out, O oh Lord. Let's pray. Uh, you may be seated, I think. Yeah. 
about that. Now let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, we come to you this morning uh, to sing your praise, Father, uh, the God of, of plenty, um, who, with the little that we have, uh, makes much, Lord, for, for your plans and for your kingdom. Lord, we uh, pray today that you would bless our tithes and our offerings, uh, Father, that they would be used to glorify you, um, Lord, and that in your way, uh, the miraculous way that only you can do, Father, uh, that what we bring would would truly stretch and would feed the 5,000, Father, um, or that you would truly be glorified uh, in this place and uh, in the giving of these funds and these gifts that we bring before you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Laura, for that message in music. Back in the year 2000, there was a movie that came out called Miss Congeniality. Anybody see Miss Congeniality when that came back out back in 2000? That's a good number. There was a scene in that movie where there is a lineup of beauty pageant contestants, and they are all asked a question by the host, William Shatner. Some of y'all are ahead of me. What is the most important thing our society needs? And they go one by one. First answer is, I've got to say, world peace. And then the next one, it's definitely world peace. And after that, world peace, world peace, world peace. By the time they get Sandra Bullock's character, she has a different answer uh, the first time around. But even she works her way around to it. And one by one, they all agree that the one thing society needs most is world peace. And indeed, we all long for peace. Peace is important to all of us. It's something we all think the world needs. There's a prize given out every single year or almost every single year. They didn't give it out during World War I. They didn't give it out during World War II. 
It is, of course, the Nobel Peace Prize given to the person who, or the organization that has done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations, for the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and for the holding and promotion of peace congresses. In other words, for helping people to get along, you get the Nobel Peace Prize. In pursuit of world peace, you've got organizations like the uh, Carnegie Endowment, like the uh, Center for International Policy, like the United Nations. At the national level, to achieve peace, we have the departments of both state and defense, which help to keep the peace at a national level. Here in our city, we have the Garland Police Department. They help keep the peace in our city. Even in our own families, even in our own inner lives, people will talk to marriage counselors, will talk to therapists, will talk to pastors, will talk to friends, all in the hopes of achieving some feeling of peace. When we feel overwhelmed by conflict, we want that sense of peace. We, we all long for peace. But where do we find it? And how do we achieve it? And maybe hardest of all, how do we practice peace? How do we in our own lives practice peace in our own relationships? In Galatians 5.22, Paul gives a list that we're working through over the course of this summer, this list of the fruit of the Spirit. And what that means is for those in Christ, these are the characteristics, the traits that ought to be evident in our lives, ought to be evident in the way that we go about our business in the world. People ought to look at us and see love and joy and see peace. And so if that's the case, if we're supposed to be practicing peace, then we're going to need to figure out how to do that. Figure out what it is exactly that looks like, how we are to go about practicing peace in the world. So this morning, we're going to look to Scripture as our guide, to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. You heard Landon read those verses for us a few minutes ago, but if you've got your Bible, let me invite you to turn there now. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. Landon's already read it for us, so we can kind of just jump right in and see what it is that the Bible has to tell us about practicing peace. And it begins with this command, which Peter's quick to point out, is for all of you. See, in the verses preceding this one, he's given instructions to some specific groups, what's called household codes, how it is that households back in the first century ought to conduct themselves in a Christian manner. And so there were instructions specifically for the servants, for the slaves, instructions specific to wives, instructions specific to husbands. And he's gone through this in chapter the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. But now he wants to make clear what I'm about to say. This is for all of you. This is for everybody. I'm not singling anybody out. This is not for one particular group. This is for everyone in the church. And the command in verses 8 through 9 is basically, if you want to just sum it up, be peaceful. Be peaceful. Verse 8, he says to do this in the name of Christian unity. All of you being in unity of spirit. Show sympathy. Show love for one another. Show a tender heart. Show a humble mind. These are the components you're going to need if you are going to have that harmony of spirit. If you are going to be of one heart and one mind. Be peaceful in this way. And then in verse 9, he moves from a church context to more out in the world. Not when you're among your family of faith, but out in the world, be peaceful there as well. Because he says, don't repay evil for evil. He says, don't repay abuse for abuse, but instead repay with a blessing. So in a hostile world, we're called 
to be peaceful. And then to kind of accentuate the point, Peter then quotes from Psalm 34 in the remaining verses 10 through 12. So we've got this command in this passage that we as Christians are supposed to be peaceful. And make no mistake, this is not the first time that God's people have been told that we ought to be in harmony with others. It's not the first time God has said, can't you just be peaceful? If you go back to the Old Testament, back to the law of Moses, the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, one thing you will find repeatedly is laws God gave to help govern his people whenever there were conflicts to explain how it is that these conflicts were to be judged and how it is that people could make peace with one another in the midst of conflict. If you look to the Proverbs, you'll get list after list of, for lack of a better way of saying it, how to deal with difficult people. These are wise ways to deal with people you don't really want to deal with in the name of keeping the peace. When you get to the New Testament, In Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, some of the most famous words Jesus ever said were about loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you, about turning the other cheek when you are struck, and going the extra mile for those who would have you go one. And in the New Testament, in the epistles following the Gospels, we see this kind of ethic that Jesus had taught, we see it repeated. This isn't Jesus just saying his own little thing. No, Paul agrees. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, he essentially repeats this ethic of turning the other cheek. Romans 12, 14 through 18, you'll see more of the same about blessing those who persecute you. So there's this consistent command throughout the Bible for God's people to seek and to practice peace. It's no wonder that Jesus says in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, that they will be called children of God. With all this being said, with all these commands, all these instructions from Genesis through Revelation, you might then expect that If you put God's people in a place, they will just naturally be peaceful. That if you put God's people together, then they will just automatically be peaceful. I mean, it's it's habit by now, right? We've been told to do this for so, so long. Our call is to reflect God, so surely this is just ingrained within us, and we just have no problem being peaceful all the time. But even God's people, we require these these constant reminders. See, here's the first thing you have to understand about peace. Peace is not inevitable. Peace is not inevitable, not for Christians, nor for pagans. Peace is not something that comes naturally to us. Put very simply, peace doesn't just happen on its own. Let me say that again. Peace doesn't just happen on its own. Back at the turn of the 20th century, 19th going in to 20th, there was a belief for a minute there that we had, in fact, figured out world peace. That with the exception of the occasional skirmish here or there, a civil war here, a revolution there, that by and large, the civilized world had figured out peace. That because of things like the Industrial Revolution, because of this ongoing march of progress, that we really had transcended our sinful nature, that we had risen above our animal instincts, that we had just figured out peace and that it had kind of just happened on its own no treaty needed to be signed no organization needed to be formed we we had just gotten better 
as people. We were modern people now, and world peace was ours to be claimed. And then something happened in 1914 that we now call World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars, would that it were so. And that pretty well shattered that conception. If there was any lingering belief that maybe that was just a a bad decade, that we could figure this out once again, well, the sequel back in the 40s pretty well put an end to that. The Holocaust pretty well confirmed for us that no, it turns out sinful nature goes down pretty deep. And it's going to take more than just progress for us to be saved. Peace doesn't just happen. I like the way that the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts it. He says, you should follow after peace the way you would with a dog that has panicked and run off in a busy town. Don't expect peace to come to you when you whistle. You have to do the work. See, the truth that Scripture proclaims for us is that like it or not, we are fallen people. That there is sin in this world and sin in our hearts that we cannot overcome on our own. That peace does not come naturally to us. That peace is of God, it is not of man. That peace is not something that we are naturally inclined to. That if we're going to achieve some kind of lasting, powerful, spiritual peace, it's not going to come simply because we will it into existence. We are not naturally peaceful, and peace doesn't just happen. So peace doesn't come naturally to us. But that's okay. Okay. Because in the spirit, we have supernatural help. We're not bound to the old creation. Because in Christ, we are a new creation. So for those who have professed faith in Christ, for those who have the Holy Spirit within them, how then do we, as people of the new creation, how do we then practice peace? Well, verse 8, it speaks in generalities, but it does give some helpful hints along the way, doesn't it? All that bit about love for one another, about having a tender and gentle heart towards each other, having a humble mind, not regarding ourselves as better than others. That's, that's helpful. And then in verse 9, Peter gets specific says, let's go right down to what we're talking about here. No retaliation. Do not repay abuse for abuse. Do not repay hurt for hurt. He is matching what Jesus said back in Matthew 5, 39, when Jesus told us that when you are struck, turn the other cheek also. And not only do we turn the other cheek, but it goes one step further than that. It's not only don't retaliate. In fact, it is instead of retaliating, repay with a blessing. When you are hurt, transform that into help. That is what we are called to. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not repay abuse with abuse, but instead repay with a blessing. For it is this to which you are called. So our call here, it's not only countercultural, though it is certainly that, it's also counterintuitive. It is not what we would otherwise do. It is not natural to us. It's not what feels right in the moment. The path to peace comes by trading your valid need for for justice in for somebody else's need for grace. 
The path to peace is when you say that we is more important than me. Simply put, peace requires self-sacrifice. We've seen no better example of this that I can think of in the last hundred years than in the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s. When this command, this teaching, which was prominent in the black church, was turned into a strategy. When Martin Luther King Jr. and others taught those in their congregations, taught those in the movement that the way to respond to the abuses against them was not with retaliation, but was by obeying what Scripture says here. They were so committed to this, in fact, that they would train volunteers, train those who were going to go on marches. They would have role plays where you would be called every vile name in the book, where you would be pushed and struck. And in this artificial environment, you were exposed to what would become very real very soon on the streets of the South. Volunteers were taught and told to sign pledges to remain nonviolent in the face of whatever would come. And the training paid off. In Birmingham, marchers were set on by dogs, were sprayed with fire hoses, and they didn't retaliate. In Selma, on Bloody Sunday, they were beaten and bloodied, and they didn't retaliate. And when we look back, when we see those pictures, when we watch those videos, there is no question for us who was following Christ. And there is no question who reaped a blessing. Here's the thing about this command for peace. Here's the thing about what we're taught here. Of all the gospel's practical teachings, not the high and lofty theological business, but the this is how you live stuff, of all the practical teachings found in the New Testament, I'm not sure that any except maybe those about money are more dismissed than what Jesus teaches us about peace. We hear these instructions about not repaying evil for evil and instead repaying with a blessing. And we are so quick to excuse, to deflect, to rationalize, to explain why the Bible doesn't mean what it says, to explain why in the real world, to explain why in everyday life, to explain why we can't do these things. I think the reason why is very simple. Because we read these and we understand how much that's asking of us. We don't want to give anything up. We don't want to have to get hurt in the name of peace. We much prefer the peace strategy of the like us when we win. We much prefer the strategy of once I have defeated my opponent, once I have utterly dominated this person who I can't agree with, once I've put them in their place, well, then there will be peace because I will have won. That's a much more appealing strategy for peace for all of us. We don't want to have to sacrifice in the name of peace. We don't want to have to get hurt in the name of peace. We don't want to suffer in the name of peace. But I'm just going to tell it to you straight, church family. If you're not willing to suffer for the greater good, I'm not sure this is the faith for you. If you're not willing to suffer for the greater good, I'm not sure Jesus 
is the savior you think that he is. Peace requires self-sacrifice. Jesus did it for us on the cross. He gave everything he had to give so that we who mocked him and scorned him and betrayed him and denied him would be saved so that we would know peace with God, our Father. And for those who are in the Spirit, we are called to practice that peace in the world. That's a hard pill to swallow. But I do want to make sure you understand, I do want to make sure that you know that if you'll do it, if you'll practice that kind of peace, if you'll be willing to turn the other cheek, if you'll be willing to repay with a blessing instead of with evil, if you'll follow the crucified king in this way, if you'll do it, there is joy that awaits. There is an empty tomb on the other side of that cross. That's why Peter can say here that it is for this that you were called that you might inherit a blessing. That's why when he quotes from the psalm, he says, for those who desire life and desire to see good days, we practice peace in this way. I don't know about you, but I want to love life. I want to see better days. I know that you do too. We live in a world that is just rife with conflict rife with division, a world in which peace feels like either a distant memory or just an utter fantasy. Like it's something that there is no possible way we could ever see. And in that kind of environment, it feels like the only way to survive, it feels like the only way to endure is to adopt the strategy of the enemy. To say, well, if you're going to hit me, I'm going to hit you back harder. If you're going to insult me, well, then I've got one in the holster ready to fire your way. It feels like the only way to get by is to do what everybody else is doing. And the only way to make peace is to defeat your enemies. But here's the truth, church family the gospel truth. That peace comes through Christ. That peace in our lives comes when the peace we've been given is then shown to others. The peace which is a gift of God to us is then made evident in the way that we live. When the way that we live shows other people, I am no longer bound to the old creation. I am a new creation in Christ. That I don't have to use the tools of the enemy anymore. I've been given something much, much better. I don't have to live like I used to. God has called me to something higher. So if you want to know how to find peace, how to achieve peace, how to practice peace. Look to the cross. If you want to see peace in your life, know it starts with you. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit which you've given to all who believe in the name of Jesus, all who seek to follow him day by day. I thank you for that spirit, for the way that he guides us, comforts us, encourages us, and empowers us. And so I pray, Lord, that having read your word, having received your spirit, and having placed our faith in your son. 
I pray, God, that the Spirit would be seen in our lives. That others would look at our Christian witness and would see love and joy and, yes, would see peace. That we would not be people who are looking for a fight. That we would not be people who are eager for conflict. But Lord, that when conflict comes, we would approach it with an attitude of peace. Lord, that just as you did, we would give of ourselves so that the gospel would be seen and heard. That we would sacrifice our own pride. That we would sacrifice our own comfort. That we would sacrifice our own security. So that instead of just the self-satisfaction of knowing we're right, instead we'd see something much more beautiful. We'd see your gospel made plain. Father, you tell us that those who practice peace will inherit a blessing. Thank you for that hope. May it be our guiding light as we seek to practice peace ourselves. It's in Jesus' name that I pray all these things. Amen. We're going to do something a little bit different here in this time coming out of the message. You'll see here on the Lord's Supper table some sheets of paper, some pencils. You may have noticed those already. And what I want to invite you to do is to use this as a time of response. I I want you to think about somebody or a couple of somebodies in your life who you need to make peace with. People who have sinned against you and you haven't forgiven them and you haven't reconciled with them. People that you just can't stand and you just try to stay away from as much as you can. People who are in your sphere of influence where there is no peace between the two of you. And my invitation to you in this time is to come forward, take one of those sheets of paper, write that name down, and stick it in your pocket. And that sheet of paper will be your reminder this week to practice peace in your own life, to seek reconciliation, to let the Spirit shine in your life. While we're doing this, I'm going to sing a song that Taylor and I first introduced to you three weeks ago. It's a song called The Jesus Way. It's one that we'll sing a few more times over the course of the summer because it speaks to the life that we are called to live in the Spirit. So I'll sing those words. As you pick up the chorus, I invite you to sing along. This isn't meant to be purely a solo. So I'll sing it as you pick up the words. Join in with me singing congregationally. Write your name. Stick it in your pocket. Seek to practice peace this week. And we'll sing these words together the Jesus way. Let's stand together. And let's respond together. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. And if you're burdened, I'll share the weight. And if you're hopeless, then let me show you. There's hope in the Jesus way. I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus. He wore my sin, I'll 
Gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. If you strike me, I will embrace you. And if you chain me, I'll sing his praise. And if you kill me, my home is heaven. For I choose the Jesus way. I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin and I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. I choose surrender. I choose to love. Oh, God, my Savior, you'll always be enough. I choose forgiveness. I choose grace. I choose to worship no matter what I face. I choose the Jesus way, 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 I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, he wore my sin and I'll gladly wear his name, he is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. Thank you for your response, and thank you for your worship here today. Let me remind you to be in prayer for our kids and for our adults for Vacation Bible School this week. I hope to see so many of your faces over these next five nights, and especially on family night on Friday. would love to see every single one of you here taking part in the good work that's going to be happening in this place this week. And so as we get ready to dismiss and Men, as you get ready to receive your gift on the way out, your Father's Day present on the way out, I just want to leave you with this word of benediction. To live in peace, to love in peace, to practice peace, to go in peace.